I'm Chad Main, the founder of legal services company Percipient, and this is Technically Legal, a podcast about legal technology and innovation in the legal industry. In today's episode, I talked to James Fisher and Kevin Broyles about how they grew a law firm with only five attorneys to be big enough to enter the AmLaw 200. And they did this all by leveraging technology and working remotely before remote work was even a thing for lawyers. So it's an afternoon in the early 2000s, and because the first internet bubble was popping, two tech lawyers find themselves without much to do, and so they decide to go see a matinee showing in Black Hawk Down. These two attorneys are named James Fisher and Kevin Broyles. That particular afternoon was not the only slow one for them. Because they were tech lawyers, work for them was starting to dry up, and colleagues at their law firm were getting laid off left and right. Although James and Kevin had opportunities to go to different firms, they started looking around at how their current firm was run, and they figured there had to be a better way of doing things. And that's when the seeds were sown, for what would become an AMLAW 200 law firm bearing their names, Fisher Broyles. From the get-go, they concluded that law firms had a lot of overhead they probably didn't need, which in turn required them to charge high hourly rates. Not the least of these expenses was real estate. They also understood that while support staff is important, lawyers are hired for what they know, not based upon how many people the firm has in the word processing pool. As a side note here to younger attorneys, remember, this is the early 2000s, and yes, law firms had many people in word processing pools. Who knows? There are probably still law firms out there that still have word processing pools, but that's the point. James and Kevin figured out that there were ways to streamline how law firms worked, including ditching an office and getting rid of excess support staff. So let's fast forward to 2022. Fisher Broyles has grown from only five attorneys to almost 300, and just a couple years ago, they entered the AMLAW 200. In January, they just announced that 2021 was their best year ever, and they had $136 million in revenue. And they did this all by leveraging technology and working remotely before remote work was even a thing for lawyers. We'll let Kevin kick off their story. It was just emblematic of the state that we were in after the internet bubble burst back in 2002. We, we didn't have anything to do at the traditional firm. Our clients were going out of business left and right. And so, you know, one day I said, I don't have any work. And James said, I don't either. I said, well, do you want to go see a movie? <laughs> we just went up the street and went in a movie theater and we're probably only four or five people total in there, but we had nothing to do. And so that's what led to the discussions. How do we survive going forward? There's got to be something done about the traditional model. We've got to, you know, we've got to reanalyze this and fix it. And so the two of you met because you both worked at the same law firm and were hired basically within a short amount of time of each other, right? That's true. Within a week. And so how is it that, if business is slow because you're tech lawyers and it's during the tech bust, how is it instead of, you know, sticking on at a law firm or finding another law firm, you guys decide to take the jump and do it yourself? Well, I had been a litigator before, so I had opportunities if I wanted to go, you know, practice litigation anywhere. And I just, I wasn't a big fan personally of doing litigation. So, you know, that didn't leave a lot of options. No one was hiring on the transactional side. Uh, for the most part, there was, not a lot of places to go. Uh, James is an international guy, so he had some options where some firms were interested in expanding their international footprint. But uh, I, I could go, there was no in-house opportunities, so I could go to another firm to do litigation or we could start an, you know, our own firm. And you know, we were so disillusioned with the practice of law within the traditional model at that time, it was right for us to sit down and think about doing it a different way. And we had so much time on our hands that that's exactly what we did. I mean, it's not just going to see a movie. You know, we would knock off early from the office because we didn't have billable hours and just go grab a drink and talk about this stuff. And it wasn't just James and, and I, it was a lot of different people uh, in the firm who didn't have work. And we would, you know, talk to them and think about ways to do things. And then it progressed to talking to the clients. And that's where the real foundation of this firm was, was talking to attorneys and talking to clients and saying, how can we do it a better way? What's the problems that you see with traditional firms? And James and I had already seen working within multiple large AMLAW 200 firms, the problems that traditional law firms have with their structure and their model. And then, you know, you don't have to be a rocket scientist to understand the problems clients have, you know, high billable rates that get increased every January, multiple staffing of 
matters, especially with young attorneys who really don't add value, but yet the client's still being charged for that time, getting switched up on younger attorneys that work on your matter. So, you know, you, you start to like a fourth year that's really doing good work for you. And then all of a sudden that person moves on and you have to do it all over again. So clients wanted um, a good value. They wanted stability. They wanted transparency and responsiveness to name a few things. And that's where we came in and said, okay, we're going to create a model that incorporates these kinds of things. What was it that you personally were disillusioned or either one of you were disillusioned with? And we talked to clients and they were kind of disillusioned too, but what was it for you two personally that made this the choice you made? Well, I'll tell you what happened to me. I mean, we, we were on a particular floor in a large office building. I think we had two or three floors at the firm and they were laying people off right and left. And empty offices on either side and a secretary across the hall who all she did was talk to her friends all day. And people were not only getting laid off, they were not making partner. And the firm we worked for had this, you know, a business model where they knew all the venture capitalists in the, uh, in the industry and they promised to bring money to clients and we would spend in legal fees. But that was during the time that every stupid idea was being funded. You know, once the VC money dried up, this law firm did not change their business model. So it just crushed everything. And we knew, Kevin and I both knew, that if, you know, we're the only two or three people left in the technology department, we're never going to make partner. And we also knew that our compensation was being based in large part on our profitability. Well, how can we be profitable with all this, this unnecessary overhead surrounding us? I mean, it really was, wasn't that difficult to say, wait a minute, clients really only want to pay for what's between our ears. They don't care if I have a secretary. They don't care if we're in a nice office building in Buckhead. I mean, and once you eliminate those fixed costs that add no value to the client, you're being able to make more money and charge your clients less. I mean, it really was a light bulb moment that we thought was obvious. And for the life of me to this day, I don't understand why it wasn't obvious to somebody else before him. Were you always distributed? Was that always the way you were going to go? Or did you consider getting a brick and mortar office and going the traditional route? No, the second Kevin and I teamed up together, it was always distributed. And then when you started, it was the two of you. It wasn't just me and Kevin. We had, what, four or five other lawyers that joined us as well, including, well, four or five different lawyers. But most of the heavy lifting was done by me and Kevin. I mean, in terms of client development, developing the model, billing time, those kinds of things. And uh, we just started. I mean, uh, we, did, we, we Kevin already had a major client. We used that client to leverage our reputation in getting more, bigger, better clients. And little by little, over 20 years, we bootstrapped the firm into what it is today. And Kevin, you had a client. When you talked to the client and said, hey, we're making this jump, did they have any hesitation at all? Did they care that you didn't have an office, you're not doing the traditional route? So I didn't have that client when I first started. Oh, I had two or three others. They were technology clients and they completely understood because they were a few of the technology clients who were still viable. And so they understood what the problem was. They weren't going to pay the kind of rates that we had been charging at their traditional firm. So that was the foundation. But then I got a publicly traded client because the assistant general counsel had been the general counsel of a technology company that had gone under. And so I approached him, and, and interestingly enough, he was very innovative, and, and we sent him a, a consulting agreement. We, we would start out with a, you know, here's how much you're going to pay a month, and we'll commit to this hours. We were trying to be very innovative. His response was, I don't care about any of that. I love your work, and I love the rate. So just send me an engagement letter. And I remember calling James and said, hey, maybe we're just a law firm. Uh, maybe we're not, you know, this unique, you know, alternative legal service provider. Maybe we're just a law firm. And I think that was one of the evolutionary changes in our model. And then we would take that client, which had a big name here in Georgia, and shop it around. Say, hey, we represent this client. And it added credibility. So then James landed another, even more impressive Fortune 500 client. And then we would shop both of them and say, hey, it was just a process of adding credibility because of our size. 
And then we just slowly started adding partners, which was a big part of it, too, because we had to be credible to clients and credible to attorneys who had books of business who really bought into the model and, and saw this as a destination firm. So when you started, you didn't have it in your mind you were going to be a law firm. You maybe were going to be some kind of different legal service provider, it sounds like. Well, I mean, we, we knew we were a law firm, but we thought we were this cutting edge, innovative there used to be firms here in Atlanta called Red Hot Law Group. I mean, I mean, there were just everything was back then was very much you know trying to be as as sexy as the latest internet company, of course, which had already gone out of business. But so for us, it was how innovative can we be? And a part of that was just going through a process of learning that you know where to be innovative and where not to be innovative. And so you know, we won't come on here and say, oh, everything's wrong with a traditional firm. No, not everything's wrong with it. There's a lot of things that are right with the way they handle things. And we've adopted those things. But there's a heck of a lot of things that are wrong with a traditional law firm. And we've gotten rid of those things. And our clients are happier for it. And our partners are happier for it. So you raise a good point there. A lot of times we talk about, you know, here's what's wrong with the law firm model. But you you just alluded to the fact there's some things right with it. What, What are examples of stuff you kept? that works just as well with the distributed law firm as versus the traditional? Well, the quality control, the sophistication, you know, being very careful about which attorneys we bring on. I mean, we're just shy of 300 partners. We could easily be 600 partners if we just brought on everyone who wanted to join. But we have to be very selective about who we bring on. And at first we were that way because we were concerned that we couldn't afford a misstep you know, if we lowered our standards and then something went wrong, the competition would just say, aha, see, that's why you don't go with that innovative law firm. So we were very careful from the beginning. And it's just become a habit now where we're very careful about the quality of lawyer that we bring on. So that's why we were looking for that. And some of the technology that traditional firms use is great technology. They just don't use it properly. We utilize it the way it should be utilized in a remote environment. You know, obviously the way they practice law, the the sophistication and the the, the excellence is something that as an AmLaw 200 firm, we also want to be in that same category. And I think we are. Lawyers are trained very well in AmLaw 200, AmLaw 100 firms. I don't really agree with the process or, or how long it takes and how it's done on the client's dime. But overall, they're very well trained. And that's part of the reason why we only hire lawyers from those sorts of groups. And they're very good at instilling confidence in the work they do with their clients in a way that um, non AMLO 100, non AMLO 200 firms may, may not. Their biggest problem is they're resistant to change. And, mm-hmm. and there's too many people making decisions, which kind of stifles innovation. I mean, we could talk for hours on the differences between you know, or the, the issues with traditional law firm models. But uh, the bottom line is the traditional law firm model never evolved. And no one ever tried to, to get it to evolve. Ken and I were probably the first to actually look at the, you know, look at the holy grail traditional law firm model, dismantle it, and put it back together in a, in a, in a more innovative way. You just touched on something, education. You said that there are good parts and bad parts to education of attorneys in a law firm, but your model, the Fisher Broyles model is to not have associates, but you have partners and you have, I think what you call service partners. So how's the training look at Fisher Broyles? If I'm a seasoned attorney, I come over, but I'm still not a hunt, you know, we're always learning, but I still want to learn like, how do you train your lawyers, educate your lawyers? How is that put into practice? Well, we don't hire lawyers that need training, first of all. And if there's a specific area of expertise that's needed, we actually put you with the expert. We don't even try to learn on the client's dime. We hire the talent. Makes sense. And was I correct? You have two types of partners. You have maybe we'll call the the client facing partner and then you have person doing the work. How is it set up? What's the, how's it structured? Generally speaking, every lawyer wears, you know, different hats, mainly three different hats. You have the miners, finders, and grinders, right? And at any given point in time, you could be all three, right? There are some lawyers that are more on the finder level than the grinder, and there are other lawyers that are more grinders than finders. So, and those are the terms that we use to kind of designate between a rainmaker versus a a service partner. But any of our lawyers could be any combination of those three things. 
When we come back in a couple minutes, James and Kevin talk about the early challenges they faced in growing the law firm and how their transparency and business model promotes diversity. Technically Legal is presented by Percipient, a legal services company powered by technology. Percipient helps legal and compliance teams with legal operations, corporate compliance, and process automation. We can assist with managed document review, electronic discovery, subpoena compliance, cyber incident response, and we can also help develop process-driven legal workflows. To learn more, visit percipient.co, percipient.co. Percipient, legal services powered by technology. Hey, before we get back to our conversation with James Fisher and Kevin Broyles, I wanted to let you know that if you missed something or just want to learn more about our guests or find out more information about the stuff they talk about, there's a dedicated episode page for every episode at tlpodcast.com. Also, if you want to get a hold of me with any comments, criticisms, or complaints, you can find me on Twitter or email me at cmain at percipient.co. That's C-M-A-I-N at percipient.co. So it's the early 2000s. And James and Kevin had just launched Fisher Broyles, and they needed to attract top-notch lawyers and new clients. It's no secret that as a group, lawyers are pretty risk-averse. So one of the earliest challenges the guys ran into was figuring out how to communicate that just because they were a distributed law firm, they could provide just as good a service, if not better, than traditional brick-and-mortar law firms. Well, I don't think our challenges had a whole lot to do with the fact that we were distributed. Maybe it did. It's just being a small law firm, it's hard to attract top tier talent and top tier clients because lawyers and clients are so risk averse. Right. You know, you run into attorneys that are, they're used to the white glove treatment at the law firm. Someone's going to make the copies for me. Maybe my secretary gets me coffee. Uh, We actually interviewed a partner a few years ago, maybe three years ago. And he said, Who's going to replace the staples in my stapler if I come to your firm? And <laughs> it's like, is it is it really worth giving up seventy percent of the revenue you generate so that someone will walk into your office and replace your stapler? Plus, why do you need a stapler anyway? <laughs> exactly. So part of the challenge was dealing with high maintenance lawyers who didn't quite grasp the value proposition. The irony, though, is once they join us. They have this remorse over waiting so long to join us because they think, oh, my goodness, you know, I'm making so much more money. I've tripled my income. You know, I think I can put my own staples in my stapler if I want to stapler. So while we're on the subject of tech and staplers, one of the things you point out on your website is that you align the interests of your attorneys and your clients by leveraging tech instead of unnecessary fixed costs. What are some of the tools? What are some of the tech you use to get your day to day work done? The tech that Fisher Rawls uses is largely the same as any Amlaw 100 would be using. We just use it in the way it was designed to be used, right? So we have all this, you know, the bells and whistles that every large law firm has. The one area, the one piece of technology that we have that big law doesn't have is our compensation system, our, the algorithm, the software that calculates the various percentages to our formula, which is really a integral part of our success because it allows us to track all the multitude of various permutations associated with, you know, minder credits, finder credit, you know, grinder credit and recruiting credit. Those things that we designed to make compensation based on units of production versus some arbitrary measurement like salary or, you know, by the hour, right? So what that does is two things. It allows us to be way more efficient with our monetary capital as well as our human capital. And it also reduces headcount for managing. It's sort of self-managing. So you've got your own algorithm there. How does it work? Like how are credits distributed via the different types of attorneys you got working for you? It's out there. I mean, it's uh, basically at least 80% of all revenue collected by the firm is distributed to the partners. I think last year it was 84 or 85% of all revenue, which, you know, that is remarkable. When the AMLAW 200 list comes out, you will see that there is no other firm that's even close to that when it comes to the amount of revenue that they distribute to their attorneys. I mean, it's probably... 30% 30% at most firms. It's divided up between the person who's the client and the person billing 
the hours and if there is a person that's managing the client who didn't find the client, then those are the three hats where that 80% gets divided up. And I saw too that to encourage recruitment of quality people, if you bring on somebody, you get a piece of their work as long as they're there. Is that still in, in practice? That is still there. So that, that's where that gets closer to the 84 because the firm gives up 2% of its 20 for that and it promotes collaboration. I mean, you, had, you asked earlier the question, you know, what are some of the ways that you were disillusioned with a traditional firm? Well, we used to read the memos that partners would have to write that were just sickening and embarrassing, frankly, about I did this and I did that and I should be paid more. And you know, it's, it's a lobbying and begging effort to get more of the revenue for yourself. That doesn't happen in our firm. We just thought that was obnoxious that partners would have to do that. And so the formula allows a transparent, uh, non-discretionary way to compensate partners for what it is they're providing to the firm. So that's one thing. We feel like it creates more of a true partnership. And tying that back into the recruiting credit, it just allows people another factor that ties our partners together so that they're jointly rewarded for the success of one another. It just creates a closer partnership. So that formula and the distributions of those three or four income streams is the way our partners earn quote unquote equity, right? Because they participate in the growth of the firm. And in fact, they participate directly on their contributions to the growth of the firm in a way that the quote unquote equity that we provide our lawyers is more closer to true equity than any AMP Law 100 other firm. Because of your distributed nature, how do you handle communication? How do you encourage free-flowing communication? Because that's, at some levels, kind of the backbone of a company that isn't in, a, in the same location at one place. What do you guys do to promote good communication? Well, the number, the number one thing is our partners don't hate one another. <laughs> I, you know, they don't feel like they're getting shortchanged because someone else is getting, you know, more. So, you know, when you when you don't despise one another, when you don't view your loss as someone else's gain or your gain as someone else's loss, it promotes more of a collegial atmosphere, and that's what we have. The other thing is we have practice groups that have um, monthly calls. We have happy hours. We have two firm retreats throughout the year. We have a partnership call every single month that's by Zoom. Um, so we have many, many opportunities. James and I used to talk about how, you know, we we saw each other and we still see each other probably more now, even though we live hundreds of miles away than we did when we worked at the traditional firm. Uh, because you just, you would go into the office, especially if you had a family and you'd put your nose to the grind and then you'd grab your coat and leave. And there wasn't a lot of, uh, you know, wor working with or with or, or fellowshipping with people you didn't necessarily have to work with. And, and the people you did work with, you're talking about work all the time. And you just, you want to get in and out because you got so many different things that are taking up your time, including a commute. That for some people, you live in New York, it could be two and a half hours a day commuting. Well, we've gotten rid of that. So you got a lot more time for family, for colleagues, for, you know, for philanthropic things, whatever you want to occupy your time with, you just have a lot more flexibility with our model. And key to what Kevin just said, and the reason that's possible in our firm is because, number one, we don't have billing quotas. So when you go to the office, quote unquote office, you're not worried about making your hours. You're earning more for less time. And then probably most importantly, we actually compensate our lawyers for collaboration in a way that traditional law firms do not. So our lawyers know that if they bring in work and give it to somebody else, they're going to receive 32% of the revenue that's paid by that client. So there's a direct financial incentive to collaborate and communicate without all the disincentives that Kevin mentioned. One of the things Kevin mentioned, too, was that different practice groups handle communication in the way they work differently. And I, I saw in an article when I was doing research on the firm, that you, some of the effect that partners don't subsidize the expenses of others. If a group wants something, some tech, some tool or anything at all, they foot the bill. How does that work specifically? Well, we just we'll charge the group. 
uh, the members who want to participate. We have a pretty complex compensation and distribution system. So we will you know, provide them with what they've earned, and then we'll have a listing of things that are taken out, whether it be health care or LexisNexis or dental or, you know, whatever the firm actually provides that doesn't benefit the whole firm, then we'll charge the individual lawyers for that. Of course, they can also go get their own office space if they want, and, you know, they can pay for that directly. But we also have employees that are dedicated to certain partners, and we'll charge those partners for those employees. I know office space, obviously that's the exception, not the rule, but you guys will use rent an office for a one-off of a meeting if you need it. How many of your attorneys do though have an office they go to more days than not? Oh, some do. I don't even know. If we have close to 300, I would be shocked if it's more than 8% who have an office, probably less than five. So advice to someone that wants to start a distributed law firm, what's the one piece of advice you'd give them based on what you've learned over the last 20 years? Don't waste your time on us. <laughs> no, no, I was going to say, hire Fisher Bro to handle your back office, and we'll provide the platform for you. Duly noted. With that in mind, too, what's the future? I think it was James that said, and it might be Kevin, James said you want to be in uh, MR100 in four countries. So what are you going to do to get there? Well, we're going to do what we did this morning, which was hire, offer a partner who you know has a book of business north of $3 million, who's at an AMLAW 100 firm, who finally gets it after COVID and says, I don't need to be subsidizing this firm, providing stuff that I don't even need. So uh, this guy's in New York. He's going to join us, I'm sure. And he's probably going to make, you know, 1.5 to $2 million a year. And he's probably making 700000 today. That's one way. We're also looking at a group at, from another AMLAW 100 firm in Europe to open another office in a different country in Europe. So you know, it's slow and steady. It takes time to develop such an innovative model and to grow large enough to be an AMLAW 200. So what does the future hold for us? I think James is right. It's AMLAW 100. What does the future hold for the market? I think large traditional firms will continue to, as James likes to say, innovate at the edges. We're not really going to take the steps that they need to take to become distributed in an effective way. In fact, I don't think they can because as James said earlier, there's too many decision makers, too many cooks in the kitchen. They can't go in it. It's like trying to, you know, I don't know if you ever saw that movie Battleship, where they go get the old battleship and they throw an anchor down and it kind of turns <laughs> like it's totally fictitious. But that's, it's, it's what like a traditional firm is. You know, they'll throw the anchor down and then they'll just, the anchor will just break or the ship will fall apart. <laughs> I mean, they can't turn on a dime like that with such an enormous structure that's, built for the 20th century, not the 21st century. So I guess the future for them is a shipwreck if they, they try that to. <laughs> yeah, the, the funny thing about law firms is that the bigger you get, the faster you grow. And it took us 20 years to go from six lawyers to Hamlet 100. I suspect it'll take us less than five years to go from Hamlet 200 to Hamlet 100 because and COVID really supercharged that acceleration phenomenon. So we're going like mad. And uh, the good news is that the infrastructure we built and the technology is all scalable. So we see bright things in the future. What's not asked in interviews about your firm, about your practice, about your history that you want to be asked and want to, want to get out there? Diversity. I'm telling you, our firm is the most inclusive law firm in the history of the world, <laughs> because we have a fixed formula. There's not discretion where any you know marginalized group, historically marginalized group, is going to feel like they're getting screwed over by the management of the firm because it's transparent. Everyone sees what everyone else makes. It's formula-based, so they know it's fair. That's the one thing I think maybe we don't do as good a job of touting, but we try because we probably have we're in the top five when it comes to diversity of AMLAW 200 firms, as far as the number of female partners, the number of people of color, the percentages. That's a story that needs to be told because we figured the problem out. If you look at legal publications, they're talking about this all the time. You know, how do law firms, how do they inclusify with minority candidates? And we've fixed it. I mean, the door's open. It's transparent. This is an inclusive environment where everyone's welcome and can thrive. So, 
I think that's a message that we'd really like to get out there. Um, and we're having success, obviously. James and I didn't sit down and go, oh, let's create a firm that will be inclusive at the beginning. But it's one of the positive outcomes of the model that we've created, and we want everyone to know it. I would add to that another unique aspect of Fisher Broils. It's the ESG or the environmental impact <laughs> angle of our firm. There is no AMLA 200 firm in existence that even compares at all to Fisher Broils in terms of being environmentally friendly. I will guarantee we have the smallest carbon footprint of any serious law firm in the world. That's a good point. I mean, our lawyers don't commute. Most of our stuff's non-paper. Everything's over the internet for the most part. Very little traveling post-COVID. So it's a very environmentally friendly law firm, which, you know, traditional law firms are quite the opposite. That's a great point. Great point. Well, Kevin, James, appreciate your time. People want to learn more about either one of you or the firm. Where should they go? FisherBroils.com. Well, that's a wrap for today's episode of Technically Legal. As always, I really appreciate your support and listening. If you want to subscribe, you can find us on most major podcast platforms like Spotify, iTunes, Google, iHeartRadio, et cetera, et cetera. If you want to get a hold of me, my email is cmain at percipient.co. That's C-M-A-I-N at percipient.co. Thanks again for listening, and this has been another episode of Technically Legal.